So into our previous video already we have seen how we can create your application and how we can deploy our application on your G Cloud. Now here into application engine we have created one application and we have also enabled it that it is accessible over the internet as we have deployed it by using your Google Cloud here or you can say your app engine. Now what if, if I want to uh, create or you know if I have updated this particular application and I want that, uh, you know, to create a different version of this particular application. So existingly, the application which we have, that is having a version as version 1, right? So this is your instance 1, which is containing one instance, and this is the first version which we have created and is serving. Now, what if, if I want to create a new version? So for creating a new version, again, we need to do the same thing. We are going to move into your test one and we are going to deploy an application into our test one. So for that, again, um, I'm moving into my console and uh, again, I'm going to copy a different application from my GAE. That is a Git repository. I have introduced it previously. So move into your Java and Java, we are going to move into your Java program set too. So here uh, again, this is the particular, uh, you know, your application which has been created by using your Java. And I'm going to download this to your And I'm going to copy this code so that we can clone it to your application engine. So I'm just going to copy the same. And here we are going to move. And again, same thing. I'm going to create a new directory here with name version 2. And I'll move into your version 2 here. And get clone. Paste it out. So it's receiving the complete object. Once it is done, we will give the command ls so that we can view the content of it. We'll move into your GAE ls Java. And into Java again, we have a directory with name Java program set 2. Into program set 2, I'm going to list it out. So this is your list which contains the complete configuration files or your application files here now what we need to do is again we are going to install it by using your maven install so it's installed and then we are going to again run your app engine and once it is run we will have a look on our web browser whether uh, we are able to run it well and the application is running properly then we are going to deploy the same so now you can see on port number 8080 we are able to see this uh, application running over here i'm going to close this app now and then i'm going to deploy the same by giving command mvn as usual app engine deploy and hit enter I can see it has been uploaded or you can say it's getting uploaded and it is updating your services which is default services once it is done once it's completed then we are going to move back to our versions and check whether both the versions of your applications are available so if you want to view the application in the web browser you can again run your G cloud app browser so that you will be able to see whether you are able to run it on your browser or not this time I'm going to hit enter so you can see this is the link which you can use to access your new version of the application here. So uh, again, we'll click on version and we are going to just refresh it out so that I'm able to get the updated things here. Into versions, now you can check there are two different versions available. That is my 
uh, earlier created one of the Java application instance that is zero and this is a one. So these are the two versions which are available and still it is serving your version one and hundred percent traffic is allocated to your version one application. So this is how generally we can create a multiple versions of your applications into your uh, app engine. So here we can see into versions, we have two different versions available now here. Again, we can move back to our versions. These are the versions available. We can check to our versions and we can work it out, right? So again, into next video, we are coming up with more features of your app engine. So keep watching and get upgraded. So just reminding you that uh, into our previous video already, we have seen how we can create multiple versions of your applications. And we have deployed it to a single application engine project, right? So that example we can take like whenever we are, you know, working on some application and that particular application we have created and there's some certain feedbacks which we have got, right? I want that the new application should be updated with the whatever the loopholes I had in my previous version. So this can be one of the case. Or one case we generally have like you have an application which is running and you have multiple traffics you know connecting to that particular application they are requesting and accessing those applications so automatically what happens you know because it's using the one instance automatically it gets tremendous traffic to connecting to it so if you want to balance load so you can create two different versions of this particular applications and then you can you know split the traffic and the next thing that you have a scenario where generally you have two different departments like your admin department, your marketing department, and you are separating, uh, you know, sorry. And you are deploying two different applications for both the teams which you have. So you can create two different applications and split your traffics among the role they are playing or the designation what they have. So here we are going to see how we are going to split this particular traffic in very first method, like when we are having uh, two different versions of your applications, or we can also use this particular spread traffic applications when you have uh, two different, you know, web servers connected and you have deployed application, the same level of application, and you are going to split the traffic or divide the traffic between both the servers. So here we are going to talk about the split traffic. So already we have seen you can use the split traffic to specify the percentage distribution of your traffic across two or more versions within a service. And the split traffic allows you to conduct your multiple testing for your both the applications or both the versions and it provides a control over the pace when you're rolling out your features as well. So traffic splitting is generally applied to your URL that do not express a target of version or we can say uh, it also use a URL spread traffic because they target all the available versions within the same services. Like as we said, or as we discussed, we have two different applications. One is having a sub version of the application, other is having, um, you know, a different version of the application. Or you're having two different applications created for your marketing and your, uh, you know, other developer department. So you can split those particular application, you can divert those applications and those users to the to connect those applications itself so uh, here we are going to see how we are going to divert this traffic and uh, again before we start and before we move ahead we also should ensure that you are avoiding the caching issues because generally suppose if you are uh, you know splitting your traffic or you're not dividing the traffic sometimes you have uh, different issues and you have different three different parameters how we can split this traffic either you can split it by using your percentage of your uh, traffic coming in or your IP addresses or you can say by using your cookies so if you're using your cookies sometimes you face a caching issue because for example we can say here um, assume you are splitting a traffic between two different versions uh, that is your version 1 and version 2 and some external cacheable resources changed between the versions for example, you're deploying your HTML file or you are having a web server and you're deploying your website. So now we assume that the client make a request and response to contain an external reference to the cached file that is a version one to the local host HTTP cache. And it will retrieve the file if it is in the cache, regardless of which version of the file is cached and which versions of the application sent to the responses. 
So this cache resources could be incompatible with the data what you have sent in RIP response. So to avoid this, you also ensure that uh, you set up both the cache control and you keep an expires address to it into your code so that um, you can avoid this caching problems. So already we have created an application where generally we have mentioned the limitation of your headers. So um, we are going to work on split traffic directly here. So you can see this is my application uh, which we have deployed onto your project test one on your Google Cloud platform. And these are the two versions of applications generally we have that is your uh, test one version one and test one version two. Now if I want to split the traffic between them. So how you're going to do this? So you can see uh, once I click on any of your application, so automatically you have get an option split traffics. And again, if I click both the particular applications, again, you get option split traffic. So I'm going to split the traffic among this particular application. So I'm going to select both the applications here and I'm going to click on split traffic. So you can see here, we get both the options available here and it's showing you will receive the remaining 100% to this particular application, which is the first application. And this is the second application. And here we are going to set what the kind of splitting we are going to define. So you can see here, you can split the incoming traffic to different versions of your applications. The traffic splitting is useful for for slowly rolling out your new versions or you can say A to B testing different designs and different features. If you want to learn more about your split traffic, you can click here and can learn it out. Right now, we are not going to learn. You can refer this particular document to you know, know more about your split in traffic information. So here, uh, we are going to say this is the three points we have. This is the three options we have. We can say where we have an IP address, cookies, and random. So here, the spread traffic can work either on your IP address. So if you are using your IP address, for example, I've connected by using my IP address 1.20.0.1. From range to 50, I can spread the traffic to your first version, and the second version will accordingly work on the remaining IP addresses. Or we can define it on the cookies. So uh, if one of the you know cookie has went to this particular application, the 50% traffic will be diverted to the other applications. Or we can call, keep it as random, whichever is free, automatically it will get the particular application or you know the request coming in. So as of now, I'm just going to keep as per the cookies. So uh, you can keep as per the cookies, or mainly generally we keep it as per your IP addresses we are using. So I'm going to split this particular traffic as per the IP addresses. So it is updating your traffic and now the split traffic setting has been successfully saved. And again, we are going to move back to your version. And you can see here, it's showing you the ratio of the traffic, what we have split it into both the particular applications here. So this is how generally we can split your traffic and you can divert your traffic into uh, different applications for managing your load of the application which you have created or for testing any particular application. For example, if I'm testing this particular application, I'm updating of some features to this application. So till the time it will be serving me the service, while the other I can build and you know update my applications. So there will be zero time time for my application which I have created and I'm deploying to my users who are sitting into different locations or we can say our external users or any internal users which we have so this is how generally we have seen how we can split the traffic among multiple applications or multiple versions of the applications So here we have seen how we can split the traffic among your multiple versions using your console directly. Uh, same way you can use your G Cloud to split the application. So if you want to split the application, here is the parameter you can use for splitting the applications uh, as per your um, percentage of your IP address or your cookies which you have. So you can refer this particular complete syntax for uh, using or splitting your application. Next we have that is we can also use your API. So we need to download your API for merging and splitting your traffic. 
So uh, you can search for your API for it on your um, Google Cloud and you can download this particular API and start using this particular uh, split traffic API and uh, splitting your traffic into your different versions of your applications. So here we have completed of how we can split the traffic. In the next video, I'm coming up with more videos and more features of your Google Cloud. So keep watching and get upgraded. Now into our previous video, we have discussed about splitting the traffic into two different versions of your application. Now here in this video, we are going to talk about migrating your traffic. So migrating traffic can be done into different cases where you have already created a new version of containing all the functionalities which is required and the older version you want to delete it so you can migrate the traffic of the older version to the new version or in the application where you have two different form of applications the previous application no one is using and that is not in demand so you can switch to your new application and the request will be directed to the new version of application which you have created so there can be a number of reasons why you're using your migrating traffic so if you're using a uh, traffic migration, so what it generally does is it switches the request routing between the versions within a service of your application. It moves your traffic from one or more versions to a single version itself. So this traffic is migrated immediately between your versions in a flexible environment. So now here we are going to see how we are going to migrate our traffic to a new version of the application which we have created and so once again, we can do it by any of the interface like your console, G Cloud SDK or API. So here we are going to use your console. So here we can see into our previous video already we have discussed about multiple version and splitting the traffic. Now what I need is I am not using my older version of this particular application. But I want to migrate this particular traffic through my new version which I have created. Again, I'll be moving back to my app engine on Google Cloud. Again, we'll move into your versioning. We will check the older version. We'll go for migrate traffic. And we want to migrate it to your different version. So it's routing your all traffic to your selected version. You can see all the traffics are migrated to this particular version which you have created. Same way if I want to migrate the complete traffic to this particular version. So as it is, we can assume it is the latest version. We can migrate the traffic to our latest version here. So again, you can see it is migrating a traffic to your version this, right? So once it is being done, you will be able to see the effect over here. You can see the complete bars changes to blue. That means it is completely migrated for this particular application. You can see now it has been done. So this is how you can migrate your traffic. You can uh, you know delete your older version of your application, and then you can direct the traffic over here so that each and every users or any of your requests coming in will be directed to this particular application itself in spite of using this particular application. So here we have completed with this particular video. In the next video, I'm coming up with more features of your G Cloud and App Engine. So keep watching and get upgraded. So data store is a great way to store and retrieve your massive amount of data. So therefore, it's very scalable. But it would be still be faster if the data was served from your memory. As we know, we want our applications to have as small as latency as possible. So whenever you can do the reduce these things, that's the better thing for you. This is exactly where your memcache comes in handy. So as the name suggests, the memcache is a memory cache which sits next to your application engine instance which you have created and which is running. Any data you store here can be immediately retrieved without having to read from your data store. So when you store your data in your data store, you can also store a copy of this particular data to your memcache. That means you can retrieve it directly from your memcache letter and therefore it delivers response really fast. So this is great since you don't want your users to sit and watch for your data. 
but data store and memcache shares across a number of instances of your applications that you start. This means that they can all access the same data provided that your application updates memcache when it updates your data store. So the difference between your memcache and the data store, however, is memcache is a cache. That means the application engine platform can decide to free this memory at any time, in which the case the retrieving operation will get failed. So your application code needs to be prepared if this happens. And in this case, retrieve the data directly from your data store in spite of searching it from your memory cache. So let us look at the data summary of your memory cache. So the memcache is of course not limited to your cache data store information. We can put any data you want in memcache. Since the data is retrieved directly from the memory, the latency of this particular fetching data is very low. So it helps you to build your application that scales to extreme levels. But since it's the memory cache, it also means that your memory could be freed and the data can be evicted from the cache anytime. So your code cannot rely on this always residing in your memory cache. So always keep a copy of your data on your data cache so that it can direct your data or it can direct fetching data directly from your data store. So all right, that's the overview of your memcache, what we have seen over here. So this is now the time to hack this by adding your memory cache functionalities to your comfort central application or we can see or any of the applications which you have created or a huge application which you have created. So how we are going to do that, that we are going to see into our next video. So keep watching and get upgraded. So here we are going to talk about how your cache data get expired. So as we know your memcache, it contains your key or value pairs. And these pairs in memory are any time change as the items are written or retrieved from this cache. So by default, the values which you store into your memcache are retained as long as possible and the values can be evicted from the cache when a new value is added to the cache and the cache is low on the memory. So you can call it as it is kind of a FIFO where generally your first data which you have stored that will be mostly taken out while the data which you are not using more frequently can be removed and the new data will be stored here. So when these values are evicted due to your memory pressure, so the list used values are evicted first. So the application can provide an expiration time when a value is stored as either a number of the seconds relative to when the value is added or an as absolute unique epoch time in the future, which is nothing but you have a data which is accessed frequently or the number of seconds from the midnight of your uh, you know last four years or last five years so this value is evicted no later than this time though it can evict earlier for the other reasons so incrementing the value stored for an existing key does not support update its expiration time under rare circumstances you might have seen the values can also disappear from the cache prior to the expiration for the reasons that other than the memory pressure so while your memcache is in resilient mode or to your failover server mode, so your failover server, your memcache values are not saved to the disk. So your service failure can cause values to become unavailable. So in general, your application should not expect a cache value to always be available. So that time, it will directly access to the storages where you have temporary stored your data. Or you can erase an application's entire cache via your API or your memcache. So the next we can see that is your memcache compute units. So as we know, your memcache throughput can vary depending upon the size of the item you are accessing and the operation you want to perform on the item. You can roughly associate a cost of its operation and estimate the traffic capacity that you can accept from the dedicated memcache by using your unit called as your memcache compute unit called as MCU. So your MCU is defined such as you can expect 1000 MCU per second per GB of your dedicated memcache. And into your cloud platform console, generally it shows you how much MCU your application is currently using if you started using your cache. And the MCU is again rough statical estimate and also it is not linear unit generally which you have 
So each cache operation that reads or writes a value has a corresponding MCU cost that depends upon the size of value generally you are going to store there. So the MCU for the set depend on the value size. It is two minutes the cost of the successful get hit operations generally you have. So you can see some examples of your uh, MCU cost what generally you have. So here you can see the value item which are size uh, is defined into KB. So you, if you have the value which is less than or equal to your 1 KB, so the cost will be 1.0 and the cost of set will be 2.0. So your get hit operation is 1.0 and 2.0 for your MCO cost. Same way if the size is more than 1, that is, um, it is exact 2. So here you can see the get hit operation has a cost of 1.3 while the MCU cost is will be 2.6. So you can get this information into your Google Cloud platform. So what are the size generally you have and what are the generally cost you need to pay for this particular operations. And the, again the different operations has a fixed cost like your get miss operation, your delete operation. So here you can see the get miss operation has a 1.0 cost while your delete operation has 2.0 of cost. Same flush have 100, uh, while stats have 100. So you get all this particular operation which you can use which has a fixed cost for each and every regions and there are no specific, you know, uh, range which is provided to you as per your data or as per the, uh, you know, time limit you are using to it. Next again, if I talk about the best practices which you can have after using your memcache. So um, very first that you have that is you can handle memcache api failures gracefully so here your memcache operations can fail for various reasons like the application should be designed to cache the failed operation without exposing these errors to the end user this guidance applies especially to your set operations and again you can use this batching capability of your api when possible which is especially for uh, small items so doing so, this increases the performance and efficiency of your application which you have created or which you have distributed. Next, you have that is distribute load across your memcache key spaces which you have created. So as we know, having the single or a small set of memcache item which you generally create, it represents a disappropriateness of the amount of traffic will hinder your application from scaling as well. So this guidance applies you to both operation per second and your bandwidth. You can often evaluate this particular problem by sharing your data. For example, you can split a frequently uploaded counter among the several keys you have created, reading them back and summarizing only when you need a total. Otherwise, you can split 500k pieces of the data that must be read on your every HTTP request across multiple keys and read them back using the single batch api call so for dedicated memcache you can also use the peak access rate on the single key should be one or two orders of the magnitude which is less than per gb ratings as well so here we have talked about what are the best practices of using our memcache into next video i'm going to show you how you're going to use this memcache and how you're going to create your keys so keep watching and get upgraded so already into our previous video, we have discussed about your memcache. And we know your memcache is generally used to speed up your common data store queries. So here in this video, we are going to discuss about your service levels we have into your memcache. So your app engine supports two levels of your memcache services, your shared memcache or a dedicated memcache. So shared memcache is the free default for app engine applications. It generally provides you a cache capacity on the best effort basis and is subject to overall demand of all the applications you use in your application engine using your shared memcache services. Next, we have that is a dedicated memcache. So generally, it provides you a fixed cache capacity, which is assigned exclusively to your application. It is built by GBR of cache size, and it requires a billing to be enabled on it. Without that, you can't use this particular dedicated memcache. Having control over your cache size means your application can perform more predictably and with a few reads from more costly durable storages. So both memcache service levels are used in the same API. Now if you want to configure this memcache services for your application, you can configure it. 
But before that, we are also going to see what are the differences generally we have into your dedicated memcache and the state memcache in the table format. So here you can see we have features of both the dedicated memcache and your shared memcache available over here. If you talk about the pricing, so you can see dedicated has 0 0.06 per GB per hour. That means it is 6 cents per GB per hour, where the shared memcache is completely free. Then you have a capacity. So in US Central, generally you have a capacity for the dedicated memcache as 1 to 100 GB, where the other regions you have 1 to 20 GB where your shared memcache is no guaranteed as the capacity of this memcache can again be used by other different applications which generally you have. So there is no fixed cache which is available for you. Next is the performance. Again, if I talk about the performance, your performance of your dedicated memcache is up to your 10K reads or your 5K writes per second per GB, where generally your item is less than 1KB. While if you talk about your shared memcache, so again, it is not guaranteed that what will be the speed or what, it, what will be the performance of this particular memcache. Next, we have that is durable storage. Now, again, we don't have any durable storage for any of your memcache enabled. Next is your SLA. So into SLL, again, we don't have any SLA configured for both the kind of your memcache. So your dedicated memcache billing is charged in 15 minutes incremental for each and every application or each and every memcache you have enabled for the applications which you have. If you pay this currency other than USD, the price lists are again different, which you can check into your cloud platform SKU. So here you can see these are the, some of the examples of your price list of your memcache. So here what we need to do, we need to move into your cloud platform SDKs and their SKUs. So here you can see I'm into SKUs and I'm going to check it into your different SKUs and uh, different you know currencies generally you have so here i'm going to check into my same default currency that is usd us dollars where i want to search for memcache so we can search for memcache and then we get this particular entries so you can see here it's showing you the memcache and its price as per the regions generally we have so you can see here in japan we have 0 0.078 USD per gigabyte per hour. In London, we have 72 cents, while uh, as your Sydney have again 81 cents. So this is what exactly uh, the pricing we can compare over here from where generally you are going to locate your memcat. So this is about your dedicated memcat. As we know, this is chargeable and we need to enable billing when you enable your dedicated memcat while the other, your shared memcat is completely free for you. So here in this video, we are going to see how we are going to configure your memcache in the applications which you have created. So already into our previous video, we have discussed what is memcache and what are the APIs we have generally on your memcache, how we can access this memcache by using your APIs and what are the drawbacks and what are the features available with this APIs. Also, we have seen and discussed about your uh, service levels. So we do have two different service levels that is share as well as your dedicated. So here we are going to see everything. So for configuring my memcache, I'm just going to start with my portal here. So here I'm on App Engine. So you can see here I'm on App Engine dashboard. And from here I can select any of my project. So I'm going to select my project that is demo project one. So here you have two different versions of your project. So this is my earlier one and this is my uh, recent one. So I'm just going to enable a particular memcache over here. So for enabling your memcache on this particular application, you can see here you have memcache. So I'm going to click on this memcache, which is available on the left hand side of your window. Once you click, it will open up a new window where it is showing you the memcache available. So this is our, um, you know, available memcache, which we have created recently. So right now it is showing you there are no heads, no misses, and uh, no items which is stored into cache. And there is no oldest item age, which is set. There is zero second is set. The actual total size is zero bytes. So here, uh, what we need to do is I'm going to clear this particular cache and uh, I'm going to create my new cache over here. 
So for creating a new cache, you can see you can oh, have the option over here that is new key. So I need to click on new key on this particular mem cache and I need to define a namespace. That is optional. If you want, you can, otherwise let it be. So I'm just going to define mem1 and key type which we are going to use. So as I'm using my Java and I'm going to use the strings over here, I'll give the command Java strings. So key type is Java string temp mem1 or we can define mem cache one value type i'm going to define again into string cache okay and create this particular value now once you have created it's showing you the number of items into your cache the oldest item age is of one second and the total cache size is one zero point eight bytes if you want to make any changes to it you can click on change and you can make the changes so as of now, it is showing you, you can make changes to the class that you can make the changes uh, and you can change your service level from your share to, to your dedicated. But as of now, as we don't have those particular memberships, so I'm not able to do this. If you want to configure it again, you need to do, check the pricing and you need to enable the billing so that you can change your um, service levels from share to your dedicated one. So as of now, I'm using the shared one and this is the hits. It will show you if anyone is accessing your application and your memcache is storing any of your data and number of time we are going to access this particular data and how many times is it provided and how many times it missed. Next, it is item showing in your cache is as of now one. If you add more items automatically, it will go on adding the items and the oldest item size, uh, you know, age it will show over here so that if suppose you want to store more amount of data and you have less space, so the oldest item uh, which, uh, you know, is excess uh, or, you know, which is not excess recently and, you know, it is just, uh, you know, stored long back. So automatically it will delete those particular items and it will, uh, you know, free up the space for storing your new data. So this is how generally we create our mem cache. So if you want to clear this particular cache manually, so you just need to come over here and click on flush cache and click on OK. So you can see here it's showing you this a flush cache and it is completely flushed. So this is how we can configure your mem cache. It shows you the complete status of your mem cache. Uh, you know how, how many items have been stored and then. What is the oldest age of the cache data which you have stored and again which type of cache you are using here so and also we have seen how we can change your uh, cache and we can swipe your cache from your shared to your uh, dedicated one and dedicated one back to shared so here we have completed with this particular video into next video i'm coming up with more features of your google cloud platforms app engine so keep watching and get upgraded so again in this video, we are going to talk more about your limitations of your memcache. So if you talk about the memcache limits, it generally have some of the limits which are by default getting applied to your all the particular applications where you are using your memcache services. So very first limitation is like the maximum size of your cache data value is 1 MB minus the size of the key minus an implementation dependent overhead which is approximately your 73 bytes. Next, again, the key cannot be larger than 250 bytes. In Java runtime, the keys are objects or strings. So hence, they can be longer than 250 bytes, which will be again hashed. And again, this will be running into different runtimes and it will behave differently. Next, we have that is multi-batch operations, which can have a number of elements. Now the total size of this call of the total size of the data fetch must not be exceeding your 32 megabyte. And the last limit is the memcache key cannot be containing a null bytes. So these are the four limitations generally we have into your memcache. Now again, if I talk about uh, you know the APIs generally we use for connecting or you know using your memcache and configuring your memcache. So generally you have an available API for it. Where the memcache application supports your two different interfaces, generally we have that is low level memcache API and the Jcache specification. So, if you talk about your low level API, so generally it is an API which supports more functionality compared with your Jcache, where generally it automatically increment and decrement your interior counter values. It exposes more cache strategies such as the amount of time, 
since the recent or we can see the least recent used entry was accessed and the total size of all the items in the cache. It also provides you a check and the sets operations to your conditional store data. And the last, perform your memcache operation or synchronous using your LSync memcache services. So you have different services generally we have for memcache services. We can, you can check this information more about searching your memcache services. And again, if I talk about the next API, that is your jcache. So as discussed, it contains less formalities or you can say the less functionalities uh, com if you compare it from your low level APIs. So generally it provides you a map-like interface to cache data. You can store and retrieve your values in the cache using the keys. The keys and the values can be again serializable type or you can say it can be in a form of class. It generally doesn't support many of your features, so it generally um, supports your partial listeners or it does not support the calls like your output or remove listener calls. And also it tests uh, whether the cache contains a given key, but it cannot test whether the cache contains a given value or not. And again, the application cannot dump the contents of the cache keys or the values generally we have assigned. And also your app cannot manually reset cache statics. So we need to wait till it's getting completely, you know, flushed away. Next, you can all also use your put method, which does not retain the previous known value of the key. So it always runs your null itself. So these are the what the limitations or, you know, the feature which is not supported by your jcache. So generally, uh, if you're going to use your API, so it's recommended that you can use your low-level API so that you can easily configure your jcache, your memcache, with the maximum of the features available to it. So into our next video, I'm coming up with more features of your memcache. So keep watching and get upgraded.